Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, please, please sit down. I see you've already sat down. Great. Uh, this will be the start of your orientation. I'm glad you all could make it. I was planning on going around the room and having everybody say a little bit about themselves. Uh, there's a little bit more people than I thought, so uh, we can do this instead. Um, who here is a coder? You, you write code. Anybody? Right? That's, wow. That's fantastic. Um, who here is interested in contributing to open source? Yeah? Well, fan, that's, that's great. That's phenomenal, actually. Um, I'm so excited. We are going to have you all rolling in the green. Commits, that is. Who already contributes but would like to contribute more? Fantastic. Yehuda would like to contribute more. That's, I don't know if that's physically possible, but we, we will see if we can, we'll see what I can do here. All right, thank you for being here. Um, everyone else, uh, managers, TikTok influencers, um, execs, if you are here, it is because you care about open source. Thank you, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, know that this orientation is a little bit more coder-centric, and um, if you came here to help others in your life become successful contributors, um, you know, might be your coworkers, direct reports, followers, dance crew, uh, well, thank you. I appreciate you showing up. Whoever you are, wherever you came from, you're in my crew now. So listen up. If you're here, you heard about the, the best contribution crew around. You already know about the Hacktoberfest heist and, of course, the big one we earned last year. It's gorgeous. I know you're excited to see it and also, also to start getting commits, but be patient. Orientation is part of the process. Hacktoberfest is a month-long event where coders from all over uh, try to contribute to open source. Most know about the shirts. You can get one by uh, getting four um, commits in an open source project. If you're here, though, you're here for the heist. The heist is a competition only for the best of the best. We're all competing for one thing, one thing only, the first, the best, the big one. You've seen the green squares on GitHub? Those are nice, but this one is the original. Yeah, that's right. It's the first ever open source commit. I know you all want to hear the story about how we won last year. Yes, it's true. It was a bit of an upset. You might have heard about the fox. The fox uses he, him pronouns. His crew won for eight straight years. Uh, no one thought we had a chance. His crew is known for being pretty sneaky. But you'll learn all about the fox's tricks. Be patient. We'll start off with the rules of the heist. First rule, it's pretty common. No one talks about the heist. Clearly, there's no honor among thieves, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, to participate, you've got to be in a crew. So you're in my crew now. And only stolen commits count. Now, this is an important one I want to talk a little bit about. Um, because last year, we had a little bit of an incident. This is Pipsqueak. Pipsqueak was on my crew last year. He uses him, uh, he, him pronouns. He's got a good heart, but sometimes rushes into things a little bit too fast. When he heard that we were stealing from maintainers, he went out and stole a sock. I said, where did you get that from? He told me he got it from the maintainer of shoes. Yes, uh, that's right. The maintainer of the GUI toolkit uh, was walking around a Ruby conference without any socks on because Pipsqueak here stole them. Not only did we not get any points for that, we had to go back and apologize to the maintainer. And after that little incident, I added some slides to orientation. So stealing from maintainers does not mean literally stealing physical objects. So no pens, no pencils, no laptops, no coats. I know you're at a conference. There are maintainers here. Um, certainly no socks, OK? No socks. They weren't washed. The coat smells were horrible. All right, so stealing maintainers means you've got to take something valuable, and that means something valuable to the community. Uh, maintainers do a lot already. They work on security. They work on performance. Maintainers reproduce our bug reports and review our pull requests. Lots of well-meaning people try to help maintainers by giving. They try to give ideas. They try to give commits. They come to projects willing to help, but they're not ready. They're not able. They gum up the works. They slow down things by accident. And that's where we come in. Good contributors give. Great contributors take. We take chores and issues from maintainers. We take bugs and unexpected behavior from other coders. Oh, and those glorious green commits right here? We'll take a few of those while we're at it. The secret to our success is that we take more problems than we give. How do we do that? We do that by being in this room today. We do that by working together. We do that by sharing the secrets of our success. And we do that by being ready, willing, and able. 
you met Pipsqueak already, he came to me eager to contribute. He reminded me a little bit of you. I could see he was hungry. He was more than willing to help. But there's a problem. We've got a lot of maintainers who want help, and we've got a lot of contributors who want to help. But not every maintainer finds help, and not every contributor is successful. So there's a gap, and I call that the contribution gap. When, I, when Pipsqueak came to me, he was willing, but he wasn't ready, and he wasn't able. The gap between being willing, ready, and able is the contribution gap. It's right there. So to sustain the community, we've got to bridge that gap, and that's why you're in this orientation today. Thank you for coming. All right, you know what? I almost forgot to introduce myself. Uh, people on the internet call me Schneems, mostly because that's what I started calling myself. That makes sense. Uh, but folks around here know me as Tex. I'll be your heist crew chief, coach, and confidant. I am a uh, Ruby 3.2 core contributor. I have uh, you know, a couple billion library downloads to my name. I work for a company that um, called Heroku. I've been working there for about the last, uh, last 11 years or so. And I maintain the Ruby build pack. Uh, who has used a Dockerfile? Yeah? Who loves using Dockerfile? There's always one comedian in the crowd. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, kind of what I thought. For those of you not thrilled about Docker files, you might be interested to learn a little bit about cloud native build packs. So um, if you've ever done a deploy to Heroku, um, it's similar, but this is, this is based off of an open specification. So here's a quick demo. I am uh, running the Ruby build pack on the Heroku uh, Ruby getting started guide locally, and it is going to generate a Docker image. Wi-Fi is a little bit slow, so we're going to run this in the background. I did that all, by the way. Definitely live. Um, with Cloud Native Build Packs, you give it to your app, and it gives you a container image. Uh, no Docker file needed. Unlike the old classic build packs, you can run a Cloud Native Build Pack locally. So I've been porting the Cloud Native Build Pack of Ruby um, to, or I've been porting the classic version of the Ruby Build Pack to a Cloud Native Build Pack. You can try it now. You can see it now. It's all open source. Um, it is experimental, but it's, it's visible. Um, if you want to learn about how to write your own cloud native build pack, you can go to buildpacks.io to write more or to learn more. And the cloud native build pack project is part of the cloud native compute foundation, which is a mouthful. So they call it CNCF. All right, switching back over to my build, uh, the build pack is done. I booted the Puma web server, and that is running in a Docker image locally, and I am able to visit in my local browser. Uh, and so, again, all running locally. You could try it today. In addition to contributing to open source and writing open source for my day job, I also have spent the last 10 years trying to help others contribute to open source through my project, uh, Code Triage. Code Triage will send open source in issues in your inbox, and about 70,000 developers have signed up uh, to date. Um, also, did I mention? It's free. Uh, people come to Code Triage willing, but not everyone finds success, and that is actually how I found out about this contribution gap. Last year, I decided to do something about it. Um, I wrote a book designed to help contributors get ready and able called How to Open Source. Um, if you go to howtoopensource.dev, how there are free cheat sheets, a free sample chapter. It is DRM free. It is Creative Commons licensed. And for the duration of the conference, um, you can take $23 off with code uh, Philly ETE 23 I've also got How to Open Source stickers for anybody who wants one. Please come say hi. Uh, I would also love to hear about your open source stories or problems or successes. You know, just come talk to me. I, I promise I'm, I'm nice, I think. Um, okay, now you know a little bit about me. I want to introduce you to last year's crew. You'll hear about how we stumbled through our first heist and, of course, how we won the big one. Let's roll. You met Pipsqueak already. He's a fast talker, fast walker, and he came to me last year with one of his buddies, Raffi. So this is Raffi. Raffi is a Rust developer, totally new to open source. Uses they, them pronouns. We were all at the hideout, working away. I was heads down at my desk. I was eyeing a choice typo when I heard pacing in the hallway. Eventually, I poked my head out and saw one dejected giraffe. Raffi raised their eyes to meet mine, 
with a mix of terror and grief, looked miserable. I put down my work in progress and walked over. I can't do anything right, Ratty complained. I've been in this crew for over a week, and I've not found a single thing to steal. I offered to take them out to my favorite smoothie place and talk things over. We got to the smoothie shop, and the place was packed. Line out the door. People waiting for clean tables. We got our drinks, sat down. I got a strawberry agua fresca. Rafi had spinach and kale. So what's the problem? Can't find a project to work on, I asked. <sighs> I already know the project I want to work on. That was the first thing I decided. I picked out a dependency for my cargo lock file that I use all the time. I want to help. I just can't get started. I'm not ready. Well, you're not alone. Lots of contributors don't feel ready to contribute. I've heard it all. I don't have time. I'm not experienced enough. It's just too overwhelming. I'm scared. What happens if I mess up and it's just right in front of everyone? I'm, I don't have anything to add or somebody else is going to do it better than me. I can relate, said Rafi. Someone else will do it better than me. Have you ever heard of the bystander effect, I asked. Rafi shook their head no. How about you in orientation? Have you ever heard of the bystander effect? Yeah? Yeah? All right. Um, who knows but assumed somebody else would raise their hand? <laughs> uh, uh. I sat with Rafi and told them that the bystander effect is when a coder sees, sees a problem but thinks someone else will fix it. It's not limited to code. CPR is a life-saving technique that is required by all lifeguards in the United States. It's the thing in movies where you press on someone's chest. The first thing you learn in CPR is to identify someone in the crowd, single them out, and then ask that person to call emergency services. I'm not asking you because it's not an emergency, but this is what you're supposed to do. Do you know why they do that, I asked. Rafi was guessing because of the bystander effect? Exactly. By singling someone out, you can break the bystander effect. Without that crucial step, people would expect someone else to do it. Sounds a little bit like what you're going through. You're not giving yourself permission to act, and you're afraid of what might happen if you do. I feel like that sometimes, too. When I hit a bug in a library, I feel like I don't have permission to report it. When I feel that way, I ask if there's an action I can take. Any action, even if it's small. A trick I learned is to assume that I am the only person in the world that knows about this problem. I like that. I'll try. But I don't know a small action I can take. Well, looking for an action is action. You can start by looking at the work that maintainers are already doing. I don't understand, said Rafi. I thought for a moment, took a big sip of my drink, looked around the room. What do you see around? I asked. Well, I see smoothies, a long line of customers. One cash register, two blenders, three employees, one is at the cash register, one is making smoothies, one is clearing off tables. But what does this have to do with open source? Those employees aren't just employees, they're also maintainers. They're maintaining the smoothie shop. If this smoothie shop was open source, how could you contribute? How could you make it better? You mentioned a long line. That sounds like a problem to me. What could make the line smaller? What could you do to reduce the wait time? Rafi protested. I can't do anything. I'm just a customer. I can't ring people up. I'm not allowed to put my hooves on the blender. I don't have permission. You're right. You don't have the permission to do those things. Those are your constraints. What do you have permission to do? What are your capabilities? You can talk to people. You can buy a smoothie. You can carry it around. There are lots of things that you're able to do. Are you saying I should buy everyone's drink? Asked Rafi. I guess one card transaction is faster than 10. Oh, well, OK, it's not exactly where I was going with that. That's interesting and novel, um, but not necessarily sustainable to buy everyone a drink. Then Rafi turned to the employee, carrying a tray of cups over to the compost bin. Hey, I can't run that other blender, but I see someone who can, said Rafi, eyeing the employee cleaning up. The employee has permission to run the blender. If I clean cups, they can make smoothie. More smoothies means the line will go faster. Bingo, I said. The employees are the limiting resource. 
due to their special permissions. If we can look around and see work that we're capable of doing, we can take some of that work. In open source, maintainers have permissions that we don't. They can merge PRs and close issues. They also have chores and cleanup tasks. Rafi nodded. Okay, find a mess, clean it up, and that's how we're gonna win the heist. But there's no compost bins in open source. I could tell that Rafi needed a little bit more context. I could tell he needed to meet Coil. Finish up your drink and come on. We've got a lizard to go meet. We left the smoothie store and I told Rafi about Coil the lizard. They were a legend back in the day. Before retiring, no one could break down a commit quite like Coil. I thought Coil could really help Rafi out. We stopped in front of a skyscraper, took the elevator up to the penthouse, and we, when the doors opened, we saw Coil everywhere. There are coiled springs, coiled ropes, slinkies, radiator coils, electric motor, co motor coils, and in the middle of it all, we saw Coil. That's a dragon, said Rafi. A little bit too loud. It was clear they were worried again. They had started looking around, making mental notes for all of the exits. Uh, Rafi had never met a dragon before, but didn't want to find out if they had a taste for giraffe. Coyle looked back at Rafi and then started to laugh. There's no such thing as dragons. You see, I am a skink. S-K-I-N-K, -K. skink. Lizard lovers call us the closest thing that you can get to an actual dragon. We've got long bodies and are just great for coiling around things. So you don't eat giraffes, Rafi asked, to which Coyle replied, no, 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 I'm vegetarian. Some skinks are omnivores, but I prefer fruit. Then Coyle pulled out a baby photo. Here's me when I was much smaller. I was adorable. Bef you see, before I was known as Coyle, I used to be known to bite off more than I could chew. That piece of fruit is just about as big as I was. That certainly is a mouthful, said Rafi. You said before you got the name Coyle, uh, wh where does that come from exactly? Well, that is a fantastic question. When it came to open source contributions, I bit off more than I could chew. I had the grandest of ideas, the boldest of futures, uh, features. I was destined for greatness, and that's where I wanted to start. But it was too much, too fast. I kept on trying to go too big. I had to learn to slice things thinner. Slice it thinner, like your fruit. Exactly, said Coyle. I had to learn to break up my contributions into smaller pieces when I got stuck. You see? Mm, I don't, actually. That's when I jumped in. Coyle isn't just a name, it's an acronym. It stands for Context, Opportunity, Implementation, and Loop. These are the components of every contribution. The first is context. Context, this is how you find out what work needs to be done. Take stock of problems and resources, constraints and capabilities. If you can clearly identify a pain you're trying to steal, you're on your way to a great contribution. When we were at the smoothie shop, the first thing we did was look around at all the moving pieces. That's when we noticed the workers and the people standing in line. Next is opportunity. Once you have context, you start to ask how things could get better. Relaxing or restricting constraints, rearranging capabilities. Clear, <clears throat> clearly identify a specific pain point that you think can realistically be improved. There's rarely one path forward. Rafi started to think about it and then they chimed in. Oh, just how we found two different ways we could make the line go faster. We couldn't operate the cash register, that was a constraint but we looked at our capabilities and found another way. Precisely. Now, for implementation. Implementation, once you've identified an opportunity, you need to make it happen. This is where you apply your skills. Oftentimes, it means a pull request or a documentation change. It can also mean leaving comments, opening issues, writing blog posts, or even giving a conference talk. That makes sense. We did the work by taking care of our own mess, but isn't that the end? I thought there were four letters in COIL. The last is loop. Loop. Contributions aren't linear and success is not guaranteed. If you get blocked first, find a way to keep on going. Gather more context, find more opportunities, implement more fixes, and repeat the process. That's when I added, remember, our first idea was to, to move the line faster was costly. Literally, it would have meant you buying drinks for everyone. If that was our only idea, we would have just stopped there. Instead, we took that extra context and we didn't want the solution to cost us money personally and we looked for more opportunities. 
It happened fast, but that was a loop. Wow, we were iterating without even realizing it. Breaking up a contribution into smaller pieces does seem like it makes it easier to swallow. Then Coyle said, these are the pieces. Context, opportunity, implementation, loop. I guess I need to find something to clean up in open source. I need some context. I still have no idea how to do that. I, I have no idea how to get context in an open source project. Start with the heart, I said. Go to an open issue or pull request. Read the comments, look for a helpful comment, and then heart it. There's a little emoji picker right there on GitHub. Uh, once you see a helpful comment, ask. How can I be helpful too? Can I do something similar to this comment? Can I move things along? What's within my capabilities? You'll gain context and over time learn helpful patterns. To do work, you must see work. To give help, you must see help. Here's an example. I use this technique to get on the top 50 contributors of Ruby on Rails uh, and then eventually commit bit. This means I have permission to merge PRs and close issues. Let's roll back the clock a little bit. Before you could add emoji hearts on GitHub, before Ruby had a common code linter, before code triage was a service, it was a script. And it sent me one email every single day. It just ran on my local, local machine. I would open the issue, read the comments, look for something helpful, and then heart it mentally, because the emoji feature wasn't there yet. Then I would ask if I could leave a helpful comment too. I spent 10 days, 10 minutes a day doing this exercise, and eventually I saw a comment that stood out. This is that comment. This is the actual comment. It was just two scissor emojis. Context is important though too. It was left on a double new line, it was written by a maintainer, and it had to be fixed before merge. What the maintainer was saying here is, I want you to delete this extra new line or we can't merge this pull request. And they said it so frequently, they just boiled all of that down to two emojis. It was a helpful comment because it was necessary. When I saw that, I thought it might be an opportunity. I could remove the delay in merge, I could remove the extra re review, and you know what? It's just a comment, anyone can leave a comment. So I didn't need any sort of special permissions. I continued on to an implementation. I went and looked for pull requests that have no reviews. I looked for double white space lines. I asked to remove the unwanted line. Um, now, when maintainers got around to those issues, they could just merge right away if they were already fixed. So I had just saved everyone a little bit of time. I mean, not much, but a little bit. I didn't stop there, though. I knew, once I knew that they were unwanted, I could actually look around the code for some double white space lines. And having that purpose kept me engaged. It allowed me to get more context in the project, more context with other issues, and eventually I found other problems. <clears throat> what looked like a tiny reading exercise turned into an opportunity to leave a helpful comment and eventually a helpful pull request. To do work, you must see work. To give help, you must see help. That's why I suggest you start with a heart. Wow. It's just like you said, gain context by looking around, it makes sense now. And having to focus, having an activity to focus on makes it more fun. With that, Raffi galloped to the laptop and was combing through issues and pull requests, looking at closed PRs, merged PRs, uh, trying to figure out what the, made the successful ones successful and the unsuccessful ones be closed. Well, I preferred a slow and steady drip of issues. Raffi just wanted to jump head first in and drink them all up. I was entranced by the flow. Issue after issue, heart after heart, I almost forgot where we were, what we were doing, when a loud noise pierced through the penthouse. Raffi and I jumped. We looked around to see the source of the noise, and Coil had just dropped a giant box behind us. Speaking of help and hearts, I got some thank you cards. I use these to write notes to people who make an impact in my life, especially maintainers. I ordered too many, you can have some to take out to the hideout. Give them out during orientation. Thanks, we'll take them to go. Then Raffi and I brought them here for you. I put those postcards on your seats. I want you to think of someone who made an impact in your life. When you, when you do that, write, write them a little thank you note. Tell them why, tell them what they mean to you. It, you know, it can be short, it doesn't have to be long. Uh, if they're at the conference, then you can hand it to them. And uh, it's delightful for both of you. Uh, if otherwise, you can snap a picture and send it to them online. 
If a name comes to mind, feel free to go ahead and start writing. Raffi picked up their laptop. I picked up the postcards. Together, we headed out of the hideout. No sooner had we stepped through the door when Pipsqueak came running by. Look what I stole, he said. He shouted breathlessly. He dropped a sock into my hands with a giant grin on his face. What did you do, I asked, horrified. I explained that we're stealing work, not socks, and his smile faded. He confessed that he didn't have any work to steal. I asked him to tell me what he had been uh, working on so far. He said, I wanted action. So I went for the good stuff, beginner issues. You see, I am usually the one being chased around. I wanted to chase down some bugs for once. I wanted some big commits, but I couldn't find any beginner issues. I looked on a couple of projects that had no issues tagged at all. Others were tagged as beginner issues, but I had no idea what they were talking about. I tried to work on them, but I didn't even know if I was making progress. Socks just seemed simpler. Sounds like you bit off more than you could chew, said Raffi. I just learned about this. There's a dragon named Coil, started explaining Raffi. I listened as they recapped our visit to the smoothie shop in Coil. They got to the part about postcards, reading comments, harding issues, when suddenly Pipsqueak interrupted. Boring. I'm with you on the Coil stuff, but reading comments sounds boring. You're too worried about what other people think, Raffi. A bug fix is a bug fix. Either the test passed or they don't. I don't need to read a comment to understand that. The opportunity is right in front of me. There's a problem that needs fixing. The implementation is where I'm stuck. I've been going loopy trying to fix these bugs. I don't think Coil can help here. I thought about Pipsqueak's words for a little bit until I had an idea. Let's watch you work. If you're stuck trying to fix a bug, let's zoom in and build some context on the process. Figure out where you're getting stuck. I want to understand how you're doing work. Pipsqueak opened up their laptop. The bug report was on one side. The code was on the other. He gestured to his laptop. I started reading the code, but there's too much of it. I don't know how anything works. If I don't know how things work, then how can I expect to fix them? Context. You're missing context on how that code works. What's an action we can take? I know, I can ask someone, he said. Before, <clears throat> before we knew what was happening, he opened up an issue on a project and started typing. It read, how does this project work? Thanks for the project. It is great, but there's a problem. I have no idea how it works and I wanted your help. I need a response ASAP so I can fix some bugs and win the super secret heist contest we're not supposed to talk about. Thanks, Pipsqueak. Wait a second, don't, don't submit that, um, I cried. Asking for help is always an option, but we're on a deadline here. We can't wait for a maintainer to respond. Are we waiting? Are we not waiting? Make up your mind, laughed Pipsqueak. I know that we're in a hurry. That's why I said as soon as possible, hello, Besides, I told them I'm gonna help. If they want help, don't they also want to help me help them? Right? Well, maintainers want your help, yes, but they don't know you and they don't know why you're stuck. They could spend hours writing tutorials and diagramming code with no guarantee that you'll come back and help. Oh, never thought about it that way. Ravi says I've got to slice things thinner, that I need more context in the code. Context in the code, hmm, I could run the tests, except I don't know which tests to start looking at. Sounds like I'm stuck again. Need to slice things thinner. I want to ask an issue reporter if they can give me a test case, but I'm guessing you'll be all dramatic again. How do I get a test case? Hmm, said Ravi, you could write your own test case. I would if I could. But how can I test something for code that I can't even reproduce, he said. As he heard the words come out of his mouth, he realized he had the answer. Reproducing the problem can be my first action, he declared. That's a great idea. To do work, you must see work. <clears throat> to fix a bug, you must see the bug. Let's take a look at a bug report. So bug reports can be fixed but before it can be fixed, it needs to be confirmed and reproduced. Sometimes people report a bug in a project whenever the problem is actually in their code. Sometimes the bug is already fixed uh, in a newer version of the library, and one of the easiest ways to confirm that a, confirm a bug report is by reproducing it. The bad news is that 
reproducing a bug can be non-trivial and time-consuming, especially if the original report was vague. The good news is that you don't have to understand library internals to try a reproduction. But be warned, that's how I first met the fox. Let me tell you about it. The fox had learned that bug reports and reproductions were where crews were getting a lot of commits. So he started opening a bunch of issues, trying to trip people up like this one. The fox left a list of simple instructions. I followed them, but couldn't reproduce the issue. I reported back. <clears throat> the fox responded by giving me more instructions. Oh, I just forgot to mention. Do this, do this, but it wasn't enough. Every time I would try the fox's instructions and he would conveniently forget to leave off some important detail. It went on and on and on like that. Every comment the fox took, uh, left took a minute or so, but just sent me spiraling on this wild goose chase. The whole process made my head spin. I felt like it was never gonna end. I got upset, was not pretty. I wanted to just ignore all bug reports from then on for fear that they were from the fox. I didn't want to get stuck in an infinite loop. But then I realized how clever the fox was. If I didn't get stuck in that loop, a maintainer might. And if they were stuck trying to reproduce somebody else's bug, they might not have time to review my pull requests. If the problem was time, I realized that I could limit my losses by time boxing. Before trying to reproduce a problem, I set a timer. If the timer went off before I was done, I stopped and reported my findings. I also started asking for help. But wait, didn't you just ask, say not to ask for help? I said, don't get stuck waiting for help. If I can't reproduce a bug, I'm already stuck. I also said, don't block the maintainer by asking for help if you can help it. So in this case, I'm asking an issue reporter for help um, who is not the maintainer. Oh, that makes sense. What kind of help did you ask for? In this case, I asked the reporter to give me a minim minimal reproduction using code instead of instructions. I explained that a working reproduction is going to help get the code fixed faster. Finally, I explained what a minimal reproduction looks like. You start off with a clean repository and no other features, add whatever code is necessary to demonstrate the issue, add instructions to the readme on how to actually run it, and then finally, you push the code somewhere public. Of course, just because I asked for these things doesn't mean I got them. The fox doesn't give up so easy. The fox tried to convince me to keep following their instructions. They just dangled it right in front of me. We're so close, just this one more, just try it. I wasn't falling for it though. I pushed back, firm but gentle. Thanks for the extra details. I'm happy that we're close. Uh, it sounds like it won't take you terribly long to turn that into a reproduction. At the end of the day, it's not my bug unless I can reproduce it. It's a reporter's job to provide adequate reproduction instructions. Time boxing and asking for a reproduction had foiled the fox. He begrudgingly gave me the reproduction that I was able to use to turn into a test and eventually a bug fix. Since then, I never knew if the fox was behind another bug report. I started using time boxing and asking for reproductions everywhere just to be sure. To my surprise, quite a few coders were delighted when they found out uh, they could get their bugs faster with just a bit of work. I repeated myself so much that I put those instructions on a web page and I could just link to them. I will leave a comment, something like this. It's like, hey, I tried your thing for five minutes. It didn't work. Could you give me a reproduction and a link? When they click on it, they will get to a high level frequently asked questions and some directions for help. I was about to keep on going on when I was interrupted by Pip Squeak. Listen, 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 that's great and all, but while you were talking, I went ahead and asked for a reproduction and confirmed two other reports. Ugh, you all just talk so slow. I'm gonna see if I can write a test case around this one, he said, pointing to a new issue. If I get stuck, I know exactly what I'll do. Use coil, I asked. No, it's easier to open up an issue. Then some guy in a cowboy hat is gonna come stop me and answer all my questions anyway. We all laughed. Pipsqueak went back to his issues. I went, I went back to my PR. I walked down and sat at my desk. I was about to start fixing that typo when I felt a pair of eyes in the back of my head. I turned around and saw one of my final crew members, 
Inkster. This is Inkster. Inkster uses she, her pronouns. She's known as one of the best developers in the seven C's. You know, C, C++, C make, C sharp, C shell, Objective-C, and of course, SQL. Inkster is one of the best on her cruise. She was smirking. I asked her, what's so funny? You're just, <clears throat> I'm just watching you waste time fixing typos. Why don't you go feel, uh, find some work to steal that can't be done by a dictionary, she teased. Well, fixing typos is real work, and documentation is important. And a typo might be small, but it can have a big impact. When a typo is like a syntax error for people. When coders read a typo, their brain has to take a second to roll back and figure out the mistake and correct it. It might be small for you, but to someone just learning, it can be devastating. Also, not everyone who is reading documentation is reading it in their native language. So con correct and consistent grammar can help everyone. Well, I don't like getting grammar spam PRs on my repos. This one time, somebody rewrote the entire readme. They didn't even add anything new, just changed the tone and style. Another time, they removed my Oxford commas. If you know anything about me, you know I love coding, baseball, and Oxford commas. I think it was the fox. Grrr. That could be. Sounds frustrating. In general, sending any kind of a large refactoring is bound to cause extra work and be rejected. It's important to follow the existing coding and documentation styles. Anyway. Aren't you supposed to be working on something and not judging me? Nope, I'm totally stuck and there's nothing I can do about it. I sent a pull request and can't get the maintainer's attention. My brain refuses to work until this gets merged in and since the maintainer is ghosting me, I basically failed at open source forever. Wait a second, are you saying this is your first ever unsuccessful contribution? Well, yeah, you don't get to become one of the best developers in the seven C's by failing. I tried extra hard at this one too. I made a PR and it was radio silence for weeks. I gently nudged by asking for some comments but got no response. Of course, I know never to harass a maintainer. I'm not the fox. Urgh. When there were no comments, I found Stack Overflow posts and issues where people were experiencing similar problems. I asked for them for a review to help move things along. I got some feedback but the maintainer was still missing in action. I got tired of being blocked and turned my PR into a library that I can use right away. It was a short-term fix. Uh, it was a short-term workaround while I, I waited on a long-term fix. I posted some of those download numbers to the original PR to show enthusiasm, but still nothing. I felt alone. I know all the reasons the maintainer might ghost from limited time, decision fatigue, missed notifications, temporary leave. Eventually, I looked at other PRs, and I tried to see if I could find a pattern. I found that they weren't responding to any PRs at all. My tentacles were tied. I'm officially out of the game. I might as well go watch baseball. Oh, that really stinks. This is a, this is a tough one. I thought about Ingster getting ghosted. I could see she was really stuck. Then I thought about what she just said. Hey, who's your favorite baseball team, I asked. She perked up. I like the Marlins and the Rays. I've got my favorite player's card right here. He bats 300, she said, proudly sharing a Topps card. Batting 300, that means hitting 300 out of 1,000 pitches, right? Yeah, batting 300 is super impressive. Only the best can do it. Well, on one hand, batting 300 means that you're hitting one out of every three pitches. On the other hand, batting 300 means you're missing two out of every three pitches. So you're saying that even when somebody is failing to hit something two out of three times? That's still impressive? Uh, I should have known you would turn my hobbies against me, she replied. You're saying that just because I failed once doesn't mean I'm a failure. I get it. What you're not hearing is that the game is up. It's over. Go home. Well, that depends on what game you're playing. In this metaphor, I'm playing a game of baseball, remember? Well, in baseball, in a game of baseball, there's a start and an end. There's a winner and a loser. That is a closed game. In a closed game, the rules are fixed. The final outcome can't be changed. But after an individual game, there's a season. Players can play for multiple seasons in their career. A career in baseball is an example of an open game. 
There's no winning and losing in a baseball career. You can't, you can't win a baseball career. The goal is to keep playing. A career in baseball is an open game. Open source is an open game. Failure is part of the process, and even the best, the ones that bat 300 are still failing two-thirds of the time. Fine, you win. This game isn't over for now. But there's just one problem. Even if I could bear to keep on going, my backlog is entry is empty. I hear docs are easy. Go fix some typos like text, said Pipsqueak, butting into the conversation and mouse explaining. I read over all the tutorials, guides, and read me in this project already. I didn't find anything to fix. Well, I know how to write a tutorial. I've also got the curse. The curse? Asked Pipsqueak. The curse of knowledge, said Inkster. I already know how this stuff is supposed to work, so it's hard for me to know what trips others up. That's the curse of knowledge. It's also why I recommend every developer keep a notebook. When I'm developing, I keep a notebook open, and any time I hit a strange or unexpected error, I write it down, like this one. When I tried running this code, I got this massive error. I didn't understand the message, so I write down both the code and the error in my notes. Then later, when I got a little bit of free time, I asked myself what went wrong and what could have gone better. Maybe I didn't understand the concept, or the docs were unclear. Maybe the error message could be improved. Or, hey, you know what? Maybe it's just a bug in the library that can be reported. Sounds neat. Whatever happened to that Rust example? Well, I searched in issues to see if someone else had reported it, and they hadn't, so I opened up a user experience bug report. I said, what I did to cause the behavior, what I expected to happen, what actually happened, and then I also shared what I would have liked to have happened. Um, that one's optional, but I find I get better results with it. After I opened up the pull request, another contributor saw it and agreed that it was a good opportunity. They were ready and able to work on it and implemented the fix and sent a PR. The PR was merged and the issue was successfully closed. Beyond opening issues and getting commits, I find taking notes when I'm confused or annoyed really, really helps. It helps me feel empowered. It makes the best of a mess situation. And when you think about it, everyone spends a little bit of time being a beginner. Every day, a beginner in a new language, in a new library, in a new field, new situation. Recording what's on your beginner brain can really help maintainers break out of the curse of knowledge, and it helps you get commits. Wow, I should keep a notebook too. Why can't you grab something from yours? My notebook is empty. All the issues have been closed. All my tutorials are typo-free. I'm out of ideas. You know, I interrupted, Pipsqueak might be onto something. There's another type of documentation besides tutorials and guides, API docs. API docs are the reference documentation on methods, functions, and classes, uh, and language tooling will read those and turn them into special documentation sites. <clears throat> I know what API docs are, and they are not easy, said Ingster. What, what do you mean? asked Pipsqueak. Everyone says writing docs is easy. Well, API docs are hard. At work, hardly anybody writes them. I've worked with senior developers who haven't written one in years. Think about it this way. If writing docs is so easy, why isn't everything documented already? Hmm? Maybe don't tell people to do something that you don't do? Besides, I don't even need API docs anyway. I just read the source. You ever heard that before? The source tells you how code works, not why it exists, or how to use it in context. You say it's hard. What's holding you back? Well, actually, I, I never tried. Maybe you should try. Let's break it into smaller pieces. API docs have a title, description, example, and mention the caveats or edge cases. Thanks for the breakdown, Tex, but I would rather be writing code. Well, then let's start by writing some code. The easiest way to start documenting code you didn't write is by adding an example. Start by looking for code that exercises what you want to document. Start by <clears throat> looking for exercise. You can look in, um, in tests, in your project, in your favorite search engine, in Stack Overflow, on GitHub. And once you know how to co code, once you know how to call the code you want to document, then you can try to simplify it. Remove the unneeded bits. And then when you're done, send a documentation pull requests. Wow, writing an example sounds a lot like writing code. I can write code. Exactly. And you can learn to do the other parts too. 
Starting with an example will make writing the rest of the docs easier. I guess avoiding write, writing API docs was because I had hoped someone else would. I told myself they could do it better than me. Really though, I was afraid of striking out. It's not all your fault, there's this thing called the bystander effect. I thought that one was only for beginners. The smartest cephalopod I know once told me that we're all beginners at something. She does sound pretty smart. I guess I need to stop worrying about outcomes and focus on actions. It's time for me to step up to the plate and write some docs. I'm gonna knock it out of the park. Sounds like a home run. <laughs> nope, you ruined it. I hope your PRs are better than your puns. We all laughed. And went back to work. We worked all month. On the morning of the big day, everyone was tired but excited. My buddy, Jake Peralta, and I were a little bit too excited. Here's a clip. We're having a final heist, open source ice day. Couldn't you have just sent an email? Nope, this is the only way. I have to go alert the others. See you soon. It's open source ice day. Ah! Well, sorry about your mail. Gotta go. Nico, it's time for school. It's open source ice day. Where's Nikolai? He's crying in the closet. Gotta go. Hey, what are you doing? I was hiding so I could surprise you. But if you're here, then who's in our shower? It's me, Captain Holt. It's open source. Hi, it's Day J. Oh. It's open source, Ice Day. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Pipsqueak, Raffy, Inkster, and the crew worked all right up until the wire. It was midnight, October 31st. When the clock chimed, we put our keyboards down and watched the official numbers roll in. The count was close. One minute, we would be up. The next minute, it would be the fox. It looked like it was going to be a photo finish. All the crew chiefs were on a call. So we, I got to see his smug face when it happened. You can't win Tex, he said. I've got all the cards. Well, I am on to your dirty tricks. I know how, about how you slow roll issue reproductions. You've not found all my tricks, said the fox. I didn't just make slow bug instructions. I went around and claimed all the issues. All the issues? I opened my browser to a random issue, and sure enough, it was a simple comment that just said, I'll take this one. I knew that would throw off my newer crew members. Pipsqueak would be too impatient to look at an issue if they thought that there would be competition. Raffi would steer clear and not want to step on another contributor's toes. I was so focused on fixing documentation, I didn't see the deception until it was too late. I was standing there frozen when a small voice cut through the silence. Oh, that was you? I'll admit, I skipped over those at first. I was so focused on taking action, I didn't want the competition. Then I remembered context. The more code I understood, the faster I could work. I decided to go ahead and work on those issues anyway. Sure, I might walk away with no commit, but at worst, I would learn something, said Pipsqueak. Then I heard another voice. Oh, that explains why I wasn't getting any feedback. While I didn't want to step on toes, I also thought it would be nice to have someone other than the maintainer help review my PR. I thought either I could review theirs or they could review mine, or maybe we both have an implementation we can discuss. Sure, only one of us gets credit, but we all want the same thing. We all want to help the project. No, that's not possible. That must be why this is so close. I'm sure to win. It's the only thing that matters. Well. That's where you're wrong, Fox. What matters is working together and supporting each other. If our crew doesn't win, we know we played it fair. Before I could finish the screen flashed, the count was done. It was official. We did it. We won. We had won the big one. I've got it here today. She's a beaut. The whole crew was celebrating. We almost forgot about the call. How is this possible, asked the fox. Well, we focused on learning and taking action instead of worrying about winning. I wasn't ready to help until I learned about the bystander effects at Raffi. I also learned that to do work, you must see work. And that once I started looking for helpful comments, I discovered ways I was able to help. I focused on my capabilities instead of my constraints. Not only that, but the maintainer appreciated my help on issues so much, they asked if I wanted to commit on the project. Pipsqueak mentioned I wasn't ready to help until I stopped expecting the perfect issue to land on my lap. I found beginner actions I could take and to learn more about the code, and I helped coach bug reporters to give me easy reproductions. By focusing on actions I was able to control, <clears throat> I found things I was able 
to do to help. I got so good at spotting bugs in this one library, the maintainer asked me to start reviewing their pull requests. I was already contributing, but I got stuck. I wasn't ready to keep going until I started playing a different game. Instead of being hung up on the outcome, instead of being afraid of failure, I focused on actions I could control. I learned open source is an open game and that the game is to keep playing. Tex even told me that he only got one out of every three conference talks accepted. So he's batting 300 on his conference talks. I've always wanted to speak at one. Now I'm able to keep going and added a new skill to my open source toolbox. I can write API docs. Since I started writing docs, my team calls me the docs doctor. I got a talk accepted too at Write the Docs conference. Tentacles crossed, it goes well. I learned that I should never underestimate my crew. And just because I'm the coach doesn't mean I know everything. I'm proud to have a crew I can count on. And that's how we won it all, how we won the big one. When we won that day, we walked out of the high side, side by side with our heads held high. Now, the big one might be cardboard and glitter. Pipsqueak, Raffi, and Inkster might be pretend. But my Hacktoberfest crew from last year is real as day. These are some screenshots from uh, that Hacktoberfest crew. Uh, it was a Slack group that I, that I ran. And you know what? I call them my crew, but a crew isn't really something that you have. It's not really something that you own. It's something that you are. A crew is something you build. It's all of you here today. A crew is what you get when you work together, when you help each other overcome barriers, build new skills, lift each other up when you're down. A crew sees work and does work. A crew is ready, willing, and able. Today, I told you that you're on my crew. Tomorrow, I'm on yours. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. I'll be around the rest of the conference if you want to talk about open source or whatever. I've got stickers and uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>